Now, today we're starting a series called the uh, called Small Books, Big Truths. And uh, it's really just simply about the minor prophets. We're going to walk through the 12 minor prophets over this coming year. And it's just going to be, I hope, a time that is, yes, informative, because you probably have not heard a lot of sermon series through the minor prophets, but also because it really captures a time of history that I think is incredibly significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, is that during this period, so essentially when the minor prophets start being written, and these are going to be ish kind of numbers, but about 850 BC or so, you're covering essentially the last 400 or so years of the written Old Testament, but then we have a 350 to 450, 100 year kind of um, gap between, between the Testaments. But it's so important because this is the perspective of the kingdom that the children of Israel had entering into the coming of Christ. It's also a part of history that we have a whole lot of archaeological evidence. And it really begins to feed and fuel a lot of what we would understand then as literature, basically written word, written letter, spoken word. These are all things that God has sovereignly used in order to make his word and his truth and essentially the redemptive history of who God is known to men throughout the rest of time that we are even in the midst of living now. So in brief form this morning, we're just going to do a quick introduction as to why we're even looking at the 12 minor prophets. And I just want to give you some really quick reasons. Now, first of all, anytime that you look at a particular genre of scripture that we're not really comfortable with or very familiar with, it's a great opportunity to remind us, why do we trust and look to the whole of scripture? Why? Many of us will just run to the places that we know a handful of verses, and, and that's just where we find all of our solace, all of our peace, whatever. Maybe it's the Psalms. I don't know how many. Maybe Proverbs, because you had parents that just told you there's just good stuff there for uh, wisdom. And then really the New Testament, and even within the New Testament, it really is not so much the narratives of the four Gospels, but would be more like Paul's letters. And then even within that, we tend to focus on just a handful of passages. Well, first of all, I want to just remind us that we focus on the Bible, and all we can do is control this as a local church, okay? And what I mean by that is that we are responsible for us, for who we are, the faithful proclamation, preaching, reception, and transformation of the Word of God. The best that we can do to simply receive the Word and trust that the Spirit of God will cause the fruit to be bore that He desires to bear in our church. So we would hold to this, that it is the Word of God. That the Bible as we have it, the 66 books of the Old and the New Testaments, the 39 of the Old, the 27 of the New, it is the Word of God. And even through our various translations, we don't go down to a particular translation when it comes to the divine precision of translation. There are better translations than others. But for the most part, translations that we have had preserved throughout time from the original manuscripts, which granted, we don't have, but we do have early copies of those manuscripts in those original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, we do understand and trust that the main ideas and thoughts of God have been preserved throughout history. And in doing so, he then has caused the life of the gospel to be born continually through those that he is making his very own. We believe the Bible is the word of God. We also believe the Bible is the word of God through men. And when we say through men, we don't mean this idea of mechanical dictation where they basically went into a trance and just... Oh my goodness, look at what I just wrote. It's not like that. Um, The idea is that they preserve their humanity. In fact, you see their humanity. You even see some of their personalities and experiences come through the text. And I love that because we also understand that the Word of God being then embodied in the person of Christ, we have a whole human in Jesus and a whole God in Jesus. He is holy both. And the Word of God is a living and active thing. It has movement. It impacts our humanity as the divine or as the Spirit of God has invaded our lives. So being that it's the Word of God and the Word of God through men, we believe it's the Word of God through men for all of time. So that's why we would still look at it today and not just jump to other resources to give you some kind of TED talk, but it would actually be the proclamation of the Word of God. 
Just a couple of verses that relate to that, as you would know. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Now, this would come with it, this idea that it's no guarantee that you will become a godly person just by reading the Bible. That's not to say the Bible's not sufficient. I'm just saying that a lot of people can read the Bible and still walk away unchanged. But here's what we do know about the sovereign work of the Spirit as, as the Spirit like the wind blows and comes from where we don't know and goes where we don't know, but we trust that He is moving. Is it is a guarantee that you will not grow in Christ's likeness apart from the Word of God. You will not. So it is impossible for you to find a sufficient source elsewhere in following and worshiping and becoming a faithful follower of Christ apart from the Word of God. It is central. And it's still central, not just from a couple of thousand years ago. Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It's still the case. These gerunds are still good. It is still piercing the hearts of men. And in it reveals the gospel. We call this special revelation that through the word of God is the only place that you can see what it means and how to come to Christ, come to faith in Jesus Christ. While you can have general revelation by walking out and um, I went out on a... um, it's an adventure. It was an adventure walk. I'll just say it like that. I, I, went, I just went, just decided to walk through some trails and, uh, last week and, or two weeks ago and just, just decided instead of for a run, I'm just going to go for a little bit of a hike and see 4.52. I was looking at my watch like 4.52 miles later. I, the trail that I was on really wasn't actually coming back around to where I parked the car. And, but it's really, see, my, a lot of my kids are not here. We, we got in extremely late or early this morning, and so they're, they're not here. So hopefully they won't go back and actually listen to this. But um, we don't actually allow the word daddy is lost in our house, that whole phrase. Um, these are intentional adventures. That's what we do. And so I had one privately, um, yeah, about 10 days ago. And uh, the course is, though, is that I was glad that I still had bearings. And so I thanked God for a good Apple Watch and some other things that would, you know, basically use as a, a GPS and be able to, you know, get my bearings so that I wasn't truly lost, mind you, but simply on a little bit of an extended adventure. And in the course of that, we understand that, yes, it was beautiful. I saw a lot of things that I didn't expect to see because I was in a place I didn't expect to go. Uh, but in the course of that, it was beautiful. And the whole purpose of me doing this instead of just my normal run was simply I wanted to pray. I just wanted some time to reflect. I just needed to get out and away from all the input that I have from human beings. And so it was, it was great for a good bit of the time. But still, it took something specific to get me home. So I could appreciate and love what I was experiencing and seeing, just like we do in nature. It's a general revelation, but you need special instructions, particular locations, and those are only revealed in the Word of God when it comes to how do we find our way home to God only through Jesus Christ. That is only revealed in the Bible. Nowhere else. Now, not just the whole Bible, but why do we preach from the Old Testament? Why do we look at the Old Testament, what we might call the whole counsel of God, which would be the Old and the New Testaments? Why? I mean, isn't the New Testament just simply kind of the the checkmate of the Old Testament? Isn't it the fulfillment of that? Doesn't it simply mean that we now know everything that we need to know about this? And the fact is, we are actually commanded to look at the Old Testament and to embrace it as being instructive to us as New Testament believers. It's very important for us to understand this. This was Jesus' text. And mind you, Jesus' translation was not the 1611 King James Version. 1611. All right, so Jesus wasn't quoting from the King James. 
Uh, King Jimmy was fine and good, but that wasn't his version. The idea, though, is that the Old Testament was indeed, though, Christ's Scripture. And what we see here, like in Luke 24, uh, 44, uh, beginning verse 44, it says that he, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you and everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, okay, and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer uh, uh, and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. They're bearing witness. The apostles whom he's witnessing to at this point, sharing this testimony, they are witnesses, eyewitnesses, that Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament text. In verse 49, and behold, I'm sending you the promise of my Father upon you, that's the Holy Spirit, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Christ is there in the Old Testament. The gospel is actually there, emulated, illustrated in the Old Testament. We know Christ to be the prophet, priest, and king. Everywhere in the Old Testament you read about a prophet, a priest, or a king, you are reading about a type of Christ or one who is wholly insufficient as a type of prophet or priest or king. And certainly you do not find all three being embodied in such a way that would be exemplary or sufficient, much less still alive. They all point to Christ. It was also the apostles' text. The Holman Bible Dictionary says that there's about 250 references to the Old Testament and over a thousand indirect references to the Old Testament in the New Testament. So it's pretty important that we understand, man, it's a good number of references given in the New Testament that we lean into mostly for the Old Testament, therefore our need for understanding it better. It is the text of the preachers in Acts when Peter preached through the Psalms or he preached through Joel to make the connection of the Christ who had just ascended. And therefore, it should be the text of the church. It's Jesus' text. It's the apostles. And because it's written down, it should be our text. We're in Romans 15, 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Paul in Romans referring to the Old Testament. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may live with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says these, these Old Testament scriptures were written for our instruction that we might find endurance and encouragement. And then he says, may the God of endurance and encouragement give you hope. May you grow in this. So therefore, we will not grow in our understanding of endurance and encouragement apart from understanding even the God of the Old Testament. And with this, it helps us understand that God has been the same forever. Yesterday, today, and until the end, and even beyond. He is the same. It's not Old Testament mean God, New Testament nice Jesus. That's not how it works. He has always been the same. He's always been holy. It should be our text. And with that, it gives us a sharper understanding of the whole gospel. That when we start to think about that we are saved by a sovereign and holy God, we are reminded in the Old Testament of that holiness extends even into accidental mishandling of certain holy elements. What I mean by that is when you read, for instance, Leviticus, you see that a whole lot of blood is shed of animals in sacrificing for the sins that were accidental by the people. Not even intentional, gross, neglect, adulterous type behavior. Just accident, like brushed up against a holy thing. And God, it's not that he is petty. It is that his holiness is absolutely unstained 
by even an accidental, on the human part, exposure of ungodly things. Now, you don't always get the weight of that in the New Testament like we should. You need the whole counsel of God to show us that this is the God that I'm supposed to be able to call Abba, Father. And and yet I feel like I could be struck down as a dead man. But then when you understand grace and all of the predecessors leading up to Christ and his sacrifice, it becomes glorious and beautiful. And basically there is a height and a depth and a width and a breadth to it that is beyond what you could see if you just focus on the 27 of the new. That's not to say it's insufficient. It's perfect for what it is, but it's part of the whole. Which would then bring us, so not just why the scriptures and why then the Old Testament, but why then the 12 minor prophets as we kind of boil this down. Well, just a couple of things. They're called minor prophets for a reason. Um, it's not this idea that they are, uh, it's a farm system for major league prophets. Um, it's not like that. Um, it, it's not because they were all shorter guys. Um, it wasn't like that. Uh, they weren't by ethnicity of a minority or anything like that. Simply because of the scope of the material, either because of the time period that it's addressed or because of the size of the book, just for whatever reason over time, they were just entitled the 12 minor prophets. It's not going to feel that way right out of the gate because we're dealing with several chapters when we dive into them. But bottom line is, is that we are dealing with a particular period of time. Now, technically speaking, this would be the pre- and post-exilic writing. So again, it's going to cover the time periods of about 850 B.C. until about 400 or 430 B.C. So about a 400-year period right before the, what we call the intertestamental period, which would lead into things like Alexander the Great, the establishment who you know, was great at conquering, not so great at organizing and administrating. That's where the Romans came in and then the Romans do their thing. But when you think about it, you have this 800 years, the 400 of these minor prophets, and then you have the 400 intertestamental that we know just from a a regular recorded history standpoint of the children of God constantly being ruled by someone else or in captivity, which should help us understand a little bit of their lean into, okay, Jesus now Now are you going to establish your kingdom? They as a people had been yearning and longing for some kind of identity three and four times longer than we have even been a nation ourselves. We need the minor prophets because this time period is essential because it sets up the foundation of the time period that we have for the New Testament. It gives us great understanding to so much that is shown and seen in this. You see that God still calls his people to follow him in times of captivity, certainly not times of good and free democracy, but in abject captivity, enslavement. He still caused them to obedience. He still caused them to submit to their governing authorities even when they were vile. He still calls for them to fight for justice because it gives a glimpse and a picture of a God who is just and merciful. He still calls them to obedience, even though to them it seemed very impractical. And they show time and time again that even when God reestablishes them as a people, that they do not sustain their obedience to him and run back to seeing basically what we've called in our church for the last couple of years, heaven on earth. They grow impatient with not seeing God do things. And they try to make things happen on God's behalf. And they end up sinning rampantly. In it, we will see our humanity. Yes, there is prophecy going on here. We see God's promises of judgment for disobedience. We see his deliverance of his covenant people, which is his mercy. We see Christ's first advent foretold that he is coming Even that he's coming to a place called Bethlehem, Ephrathah. I mean, very specific prophecies of the coming of Jesus. And again, we see the gospel as we intimated a little bit earlier. We see the gospel. When we see the creation, who God is, we see the maker, the sustainer, the ruler of even nature. Because you see miraculous things go on. You see natural disasters occur that are clearly attributed to the hand of God. When we see fall or the fall of man, we see sin in the minor prophets as, yes, it's likened to adultery, prostitution, rebellion, treason. How do we see sin? A mistake? The minor prophets alone, apart from going to other 
larger prophets address his sin in this way. It says that it's adultery against God. But you also get an idea that his mercy to his people then is basically him marrying a prostitute. He doesn't love you based on merit. He doesn't love you based on your performance or how good you are. He loves you because he loves you. And you see this in stark reality in the Minor Prophets. We also see redemption. As we see Christ foretold as a prophet, a priest, a king, a redeemer, we see him in these glorious, magnanimous kind of perspectives of what he is able to do that we don't deserve what it is he does for us. But just suppose that with how we in our culture often will see Jesus. This goes back to the C.S. Lewis perspective, liar, lunatic, or Lord. You don't get to say he's just a nice teacher. He said too many crazy things. The Old Testament, particularly the Mount of Prophets, help us see the lordship, the godness of Christ. But in our day, we often see him or think of him as, and even honestly, the way, and this isn't just for, when I say today, this goes back to Boy, I think of any number of uh, choruses or even hymns that were used at invitations in churches that I grew up in. That basically we seem to treat him and woo him as the girlfriend we're scared to ask out. But he's waiting there, pining away for us. And if we'll just invite him in, then he'll come. Please, won't you? And there's nothing in Scripture that speaks of Christ coming that way. You would even colloquially hear people say, oh, Jesus loves you too much to violate your will. He's a gentleman. He absolutely invades your will. And you see it in the Old Testament through the minor prophets. Because your will, apart from him bending and breaking it by his grace and mercy, would be hell-bent in rejecting him and going after the things of self and sin. And so basically what you end up seeing through the minor prophets is just how distant our Christ is from our condition, which should cause us more praise and honor and glory given to him when we see that he has bridged that gap. But we too often over our brief histories, collectively, 20, 30, 40, 60, 70 years, We've shrunk that down so much, it's almost like if we just jumped far enough or hopped on the, back in the 70s, the gospel bus or whatever, whatever we can try to do to get from here over to him, that it's somehow scalable. It is not. It's more like another dimension. You need a vehicle that you cannot contrive or construct. It is Christ and Christ alone that can get you there. It is simply a distance too far. And not only that, you don't even want to go there. No one is left at the edge of being part of the world saying, but I wanted to be with you. Apart from God awakening them. And I mean, for instance, even when you see reluctant prophets like Jonah and he calls for repentance to a non-Jewish people, And he doesn't even want to see their repentance. He doesn't like these people. So honest. It's like God saving Democrats. I mean, come on, that's funny, but there's some truth in how we feel about certain things. But the fact is, is that it comes down to this understanding and perspective that he alone is able because he's just too far. And so when we see that restoration, we understand that it is holy of him. It is holy his deliverance, and it's only him that delivers us to himself. But even then, guys, it's still practical. And I'll close with this. It's still practical. In light of all that about the gospel and everything else, yes, we do. We see in Hosea the real nature of the love of God, which then should extend to how we love one another, which we've talked about in recent weeks, the new commandment that he's given us in the New Testament. We understand that to be our love for one another. We need to understand God's agape perspective love, and we see that beautifully captured in the story of Hosea. What about God saving in the end, especially in the midst of natural disasters? We will see in the book of Joel 
which ends up being such a critical text for the day of God or the day of the Lord, as Peter puts it, that began at Pentecost, that we begin to see how God is, yes, indeed, still in control of all things. We are left with questions, but we are not left with a God who's out of control. And we live in a day that, again, not unlike all other days, that since we can't reconcile how terrible things can happen from a good and sovereign God, it is so often our tendency to diminish the sovereignty of God just so we can wrap our minds around something that just happened that was so terrible. And the fact is, we find in the scriptures and in the minor prophets, we would much rather be a people who have questions of God's design and even that something could be good. We might have questions as to why or how, but that is far better than questioning if he's even able. Because that God that you begin to question in that way, you will question even his ability to save the ungodly. In the book of Amos, we see how does God actually care for his people. In Obadiah, we see how God deals with his enemies. In Jonah, we ask ourselves, can you really actually run from God? It might look like you're running, but it's more like a treadmill. But the idea is that you cannot, but we do often still try. In Micah, we see God's really heartfelt desire and nature. In Nahum, we see is God really in charge of your life, all aspects? Is he really in charge or am I? Or is this a shared kind of co-piloting event? In Habakkuk, probably my favorite. How can we be happy in such a messed up world? How are we to find joy? So much of the New Testament speaks of endurance, of still rejoicing sometimes, always, no matter the circumstance. And we see a great weight of it in Habakkuk that we are not only, it's not only possible, we're commanded to. In Zephaniah, we see how can we truly be grateful when everything hurts? And it's not just, this is not just about geriatrics and aging. It's about circumstances. It's about difficulty and time periods. But it's not exclusionary of the increased number of internal guttural sounds that happen every time you get up from a chair. In Haggai, we see what is really worth investing in. It's not just financial, but it also includes the financial. What is really worth investing your time, your resources in? In Zechariah, we see the beauty of second chances. In Malachi, does it matter how we worship? Which is beautiful heading into the New Testament. We see that means matters as much to God as anything else. So we don't just get the marching orders and do whatever we want. We go about things in the way that pleases God, which is going to be critical for us heading into um, election seasons, heading into uh, school, and just the, being thrust again into um, just a predominance of potential temptation to know that it's not just the end game. It's how you play, so to speak. It's how you perform. It is how you go about your life as a Christian. All these things are essential and why we would look at, and really not even um, total, just simply saying these are some of the reasons why we would give focus to these things. Because ultimately in them all, we do see, and I wanted to, I'll just go back and, and use this verse that we see in Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So I guess what I simply want to ask you this morning is, do you have hope? Because the minor prophets, their context, I promise you, is far worse than any circumstances any of you find yourself in. But that's not to to diminish the pain that you're experiencing or what you're going through, especially relatively. But what you will find in the minor prophets, you will not find a mentality that blames others or circumstances for not being able to find great hope in God. In fact, we'll start to lean into, not in, a, not in a sick, weird kind of way, but we'll start to lean into that these providential difficulties that we go through are actually designed for our hope and our joy. So I would simply say this this morning, if you do not have hope or joy, simply, even if you 
don't know if you'll be able to sit through, uh, you know, all these studies and sermons on the Mount of Prophets. I can simply tell you this. They all point to Christ and Christ alone, that he is the only one that can provide for you the hope, the significance, and the joy. It may not change your circumstances. It may even get harder, but it will be impossible to find significance in all that you're going through in this world apart from Christ being the Lord and the ruler of your life. So if you'd like to speak to somebody about what that means, I invite you to do so. If we could, let's go ahead and stand together. Let me pray for us as we conclude our service here in a few moments through song. God, I pray that you would cause your word and and Mark's testimony to be something that would ring true in us for transformation. The gospel would come to life, would be real, would do something in transforming us today so that really we mark today as being one of those days that we've just never been the same since. Holy Spirit, we trust your use of the Word of God, even in brief introductions, that you would produce the fruit of repentance, of bringing someone from trusting in the things of this world, of going through all the pain and the emptiness of having tried to find significance in the things that they see, and that they might turn confessing, repenting of sin, turning away from trusting in those things, and turning to Christ whom they don't see, but they now believe because of the Spirit of God in them they now believe is real and alive and has been raised from the dead and is the only one able to save. And I pray that you would bring some to yourself even now. For the rest of us, God, I pray that we would find all of the significance and the instruction and the encouragement and the endurance from the Old Testament scriptures that we need, making those connections with Christ and the fulfillment in the New Testament that we might endure better, live as Christians better, and that we might embrace what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with evangelism, that The impetus in the New Testament is not evangelistic methods. It is more about Christians being Christian all the time. And that that is what then will produce and will bear fruit through the proclaimed gospel, the word being proclaimed to the lost. So Lord, transform us in that way through these texts over these coming weeks, Lord willing. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.